Five Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Background. We support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today is Monday, January 23rd, 2023. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Outrage has erupted at Bethune-Cookman University after Ed Reed ousted from his head coaching job by the Board of Trustees. Students today protested. Alumni are demanding what the hell is going on, and students are saying it's time for the Board of Trustees to go. We will talk to a current football player and former students about their experiences at Bethune-Cookman and what should happen next. Bethune-Cookman is being accused of, as I said, neglect by students. We'll show you some of the protests uh, today as well. In Tennessee, the family of the black man who died after a violent encounter with five Memphis police officers got a chance to view body camera footage today of the violent arrest leading up to his death. We will tell you what happened with the family's attorney, Ben Crump. Also, we'll continue our new you, new you in 2023 fitness series. Today, we focus on all fitness levels and show you how to get started at any size with fitness expert Maurice Robinson. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Streaming live on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time and it's rolling. Folks, it has been a busy 72 hours for Bethune-Cookman University uh, after uh, Ed Reed announced on Saturday that he had been dismissed as head football coach. They were negotiating a contract. Uh, they had not signed it yet, uh, and he said he was not pulling out. The Board of Trustees made the decision to move in a new direction. We'll show you later uh, that particular video uh, that he put out. Uh, there were a couple of videos before that caused a lot of consternation uh, among um, HBCU folks and Bethune Cookman folks because he was highly critical of the university practices there, was complaining about conditions of the university trash and things along those lines. Uh, and when he made the announcement on Saturday uh, that he was not going to be the head of football coach, uh, students then, football players, launched a petition that they signed uh, asking that he be uh, returned, uh, be hired as head football coach. Uh, today, there was a rally on campus from students complaining about other conditions at Bethune-Cookman. Uh, this is not the first time the university has had controversy. Uh, they uh, had significant financial issues, almost lost their accreditation, uh, and many have said uh, that the problem there is its board of trustees. Uh, alumni uh, are engaged in a lawsuit with the board of trustees. It's a lot of things that are going on there. And so what is the current state of Bethune-Cookman? Um, what is the administration saying about what took place with today's protest? Joining us right now is the interim president of Bethune-Cookman, Dr. Lawrence Drake. Dr. Drake, glad to have you here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Um, and so there's several things that I want to cover uh, over these next two segments. And so let's just walk through this. Um, um, Ed Reed said he did not want to step down. He was not pulling out. Uh, whose decision was it for him not to become the head coach? Was it you, the interim president, or was it the board of trustees? It was the interim president. It was my decision. It was your decision? Yes. And so um, why did you make that decision not to move forward uh, with Ed Reed? So we, um, as you know, uh, about Sunday, a week ago, we, uh, well, let me back up. Actually, starting in December, we were working on a contract for uh, naming Ed Reed as the head coach. I interviewed Ed, and I had three important things that I asked him to ensure that he was willing to do as part of 
becoming uh, part of the Wildcat family. One was I needed him to really understand that we were a Christian institution, that behavior and character were clearly our priorities. And I asked him if that was okay with him. Could he abide by that? Could he, you know, position himself as a role model for our student athletes as well as for the university itself? He indicated he would. Second question I ask is, well, great. I'm glad you're willing to do that. I need to know if you're also willing uh, to build the kind of program uh, that will allow you, because you've not been a coach uh, before, this is an opportunity for you to be a head coach your first time. The university is giving you an opportunity to do that. And therefore, we want to surround you with the kind of people that can draw up the X and O's and help you become a stronger coach. He said, I get that. And I'm willing to do that. The third thing, as I said, this is not University of Miami and it's not the NFL. Uh, we just came through two hurricanes, $6 million worth of damage. Much of what we've been working on for the last year and a half is improvements not only to the university's infrastructure, but also a long-term investment plan. We have about $100 million that we need to invest in the university over the next several years. We said to him, look, you're going to become part of that. Are you open to helping us do that and build the program? He said yes to that. So when we saw the first video uh, criticizing the university and saying, well, it's trashy and my office is dirty and all that, first of all, he was an employee of the university and he had not an office. When the last staff moved out, we started renovating that building, everything from the coaches' rooms to the other places. We had given him some permission um, that he really took to the next level. First of all, he wasn't authorized to even take video. He wasn't authorized to do any of those things, but he did them anyway. The university had to take responsibility for that because it happened. But quite as kept, you know, that isn't the kind of behavior that we would expect. And then the expletives and the, you know, those kinds of things in that first video, you might call that an aberration. And I would say it could be. And you have to be a forgiving individual. But when you have this much damage, you look at the gym and you look at this video and you look at it critically. But I would invite anyone to come to our campus because all parts of our campus don't look that way. Um, we are really trying to work hard to clean it up. And given the fact that, again, we suffer two hurricanes back to back um, and because of supply chain issues, because most people in Florida, particularly central Florida, are still recovering. I have people from my staff living on our campus because their homes were destroyed. Um, Ed Doc, never took, that didn't take those things into account. Doc, hold tight one second. I'm going to go to a quick break. We're going to come back, continue the conversation. Uh, we're talking to uh, Dr. Drake, interim president of Bethune-Cookman University. Uh, you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, I'm sure you've heard that saying that the only thing guaranteed is death and taxes. The truth is that the wealthy get wealthier by understanding tax strategy. And that's exactly the conversation that we're going to have on the next Get Wealthy, where you're going to learn wealth hacks that help you turn your wages into wealth. Taxes is one of the largest expenses you ever have. You really got to know how to manage that thing and get that under control so that you can build wealth. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. An hour of living history with Dr. Richard Mariba Kelsey, thinker, builder, author, and one of the most important and impactful elders in the African-American community. He reflects on his full and rich life and shares his incomparable wisdom about our past, present, and future. I'm a genius is saying that my uncle was a genius, my brother was a genius, my neighbor was a genius. I think we ought to drill that in ourselves and move ahead rather than believing that I got it. That's next on The Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. So this is Roger Bob. I got a message for Roland Mascot. Oh, I'm sorry, Ascot Martin. Buddy, you're supposed to be hooking me up with some of these mascots. I'm sorry, ascots that you claim to wear. Where's mine, buddy? Hey, yo, peace, world. What's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered.
Continue our conversation with Dr. Lawrence Drake, who's the interim president at Bethune Cookman. Dr. Drake, you were talking about uh, the conditions, uh, him not being allowed to uh, shoot video uh, on campus. Um, what was was it the second video? What was the final straw? What caused it uh, where uh, you uh, made, this, made the decision that uh, we're not moving forward with Ed Reed as coach? I think the final straw was actually the third or fourth video, one with the background music being booties, butts, and boobs, uh, and hoes. Um, and, you know, we have 65% of our campus is female. Uh, and my view is, is that we are trying to build young men to respect black women. We're trying to build a culture where they understand that, that, that I, you know, people can say whatever they want to say. But we think you can do anything respectfully. And when we think about the culture that we're trying to build, that we have companies and partners like Disney and, and some of our other partners calling saying, what are you going to do about that? We can't support that kind of image. Uh, and, and, and of course, they're one of our biggest sponsors for the classic. So you're saying you're saying Disney officials with Disney called you complaining about Ed Reed and saying we can't support Bethune Cookman if this if he is going to represent the university. They didn't say we can't. They questioned what we were going to do. And I think that was an appropriate way to approach it, but they so, weren't the so, only So were they implying that they, that they would pull support if he continued as head coach? I think that as a leader you have to make the decision and if they make if they are inquiring they have a vested interest they believe in the image that they want to project and you have to think you know, what are the possible outcomes of you continuing to do what you're doing? Um, but here's the bigger point, and I, and I think this is the most important thing for me, is that, you know, a, as a dad and as a, a father, and certainly as someone who's been given the responsibility of looking after these young people, um, I just didn't feel that at this point, and I conferred with a number of people. Yes, there are a group of alumni who believe that the decision was, you know, maybe the incorrect one. But there was also a legion of people, including former players, including people like Larry Little, who's also a Hall of Famer, who is a Bethune-Cookman graduate. And some of those people are coming to campus this week to talk to our players. Uh, we're going to have a, a small cadre of the captains on Wednesday, and then we'll have a team meeting Wednesday night. And we're going to tell the facts. The facts are, is that, you know, this university has weather tremendous storms and and you mentioned in your opening about the financial condition and the accreditation we not only have survived that accreditation but we've received now a 10-year accreditation so we are free and clear we're also solvent as a university your, in the but, but, but your predecessor the reality is a lot of that goes to your predecessor who the board then eventually fired and, and and you have alumni. I've I've had alumni reach out to me uh, and saying that uh, they they have serious concerns that the board of trustees is not providing real leadership to Bethune Cookman, and that even though surviving that, they 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 said they still are uh, shocked to understand why they would fire the president who led Bethune. Uh, you know, you know, to reviving that uh, and the concerns that there's this constant turnover. That there's there's this constant drama. What do you say to those students who were on the campus today, angry, protesting, not just football players, but students right. talking about yeah. mold and other conditions? What do you say to them? What I say to them is what I've been saying to them because I walk the campus every day when I'm on campus. What I say to them is that we're working on the issues. I just invested a quarter of a million dollars in one of our buildings for remediation of mildew. You know, when you have a hurricane, when you are 80 and 90 degree weather in Florida, the Florida conditions are not like the Florida, are not like the Chicago conditions. They're not like other places. I'm from the East Coast, so I know what those conditions are. That's mildew. That's not necessarily mold, by the way. Some of that that you're showing on the screen is a function of things sitting in water for a period of time. So they're not showing you everything. Yes, there are some of those kinds of things, but you might also see that those portions of the building may not even be used. So again, we are working very diligently to clean up a lot of these things. When I, I, would, I would reflect that the first hurricane, Hurricane Ian, um, we were the first university to evacuate in the state of Florida. Had we not done that, uh, we probably would have had casualties because it was a very violent storm. But what happened was is that we were trying very hard to get those students back to campus within two to three weeks. 
And we spend an enormous amount of money doing that. Our football players, as an example, were out because we couldn't bring them back to campus. The university just wasn't fit for that at the time. We spent a tremendous amount of resources ensuring that they ate well, that they stayed in the best places, that they were taken care of, that they had their tutors on site. The hundred students that are out there today, if you hold up Dr. Bethune's uh, picture and you, you, know, you talk about her legacy at her gravesite, the thing to understand is that many of the students, we're trying to teach them what Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune stood for. You see, the fact is she fired Zora Neale Hurston for acting out and not being respectful of the culture that she was trying to build. And at that time, of course, that didn't necessarily go over well with people who love Zora Neale Hurston. But if you are going to start a culture and create a culture of excellence, you got to make decisions. Now, one thing about our students today, I was very proud of them. I don't think there's anything wrong with student activism and expressing your point, and they should. And we're going to continue to talk to them about that. We're going to be meeting with student leaders as well. But I don't, I'm not running away from the issues that they raise because some of them are valid. There are things we need to do, but it takes money and it takes time, and it's not going to happen overnight. You know, we brought in our largest freshman class this year, uh, the largest one in the history of the university, at least in the last two decades. Over 1,000 students joined us in September of last year. We're on track now for another 1,200 students to join us in the fall of 2023. And so while I'm excited about this and while there are challenges, we have to raise about $250 million over the next several years in order to ensure that our campus gets up to date, the fortification. We'll be waiting on FEMA for a lot of the reimbursement for some of those things. But the other part of this is that many of the alumni uh, who complain and who say, you know, they need the board of trustees to do more. You know, I can't speak on that. I can only tell you as president, um, I haven't I haven't been concerned about the Board of Trustees. You talk about the turnover of presidents. You know, the fact of the matter is this university is only on its eighth president. That's eight presidents in 118 years. So although there's been some turnover of late, I can't blame a university for wanting to try to find the best person to lead it. The previous predecessor or the person who I uh, was a successor to, he retired after 42 years with the university. Uh, the person before that, uh, he left the university to go run Bentley University today in Boston, which is where he is. So the fun, the, the, you know, it's important to have all the facts and to have context. It's easy to look at this, you know, from an unbalanced perspective. But what I'm trying to do tonight, and what I will continue to do on other broadcasts and in some of our statements, I'm going to be writing an op-ed about this as well is we need to make sure that the message is balanced because, you know, social media can distort the message and, and give an impression that's really doesn't have all the facts and certainly doesn't have context. Um, I was, I, like I said, I was not at all concerned about the behavior of our students today. They acted and behaved tremendously well, and I was very proud of them. What I want them to do, though, is to be able to focus on other activists uh, measures that need to be taken. We're talking about African-American studies being banned in the state of Florida. I want them to protest about that. I want them to protest about voting more. Um, I want to teach them the importance of public policy. Uh, I want them to understand that, you know, you just can't say everything that you want to say, regardless of whether or not you might think it. It may not be appropriate in that venue. And that doesn't mean you have to be neutered or not or inauthentic. But it does mean that you have to understand the audience. We're trying to raise money. We're trying to create a culture where we can grow that university. And we have to have plenty of people to do that. And the people who count, the people who matter, are our students. But we also have to look at the community in which would give to that university to support those students. And we just felt at this point it wasn't a good fit for Ed and I or Ed and the university to agree on what kind of conditions he would have to um, come to and help us create and help us grow, he wasn't in agreement with that. He felt that he needed to say his piece and call attention to the challenges as opposed to the opportunities. I can't blame him for that. I don't have anything bad to say about Ed. Um, it just wasn't appropriate for us to make the decision to continue contract negotiations. You, you, you made a point about the leadership there. Uh, there was a piece uh, that uh, was from 
uh, the uh, Florida Courier, where they talked about what needed to happen. And they talked about how uh, one of the presidents, uh, Kreit, uh, who dealt with a number of different issues, the board fired him. Uh, and based upon the, the, the publisher, we're going to have him on the show later, uh, led them through uh, that and then was replaced. You had the, the current board, the board chair, uh, tried to put his name into the hat to be the president, but they found him not to be qualified to hold the position. But now he's also the board chair. Uh, and so what I really want to get at, and I have another break coming up, and so we can come back and you can answer this. Um, yeah. Because what I, again, uh, I've got alumni, and here's the deal. I've, I've, I've spoken at Bethune Cookman, I think, two or three times. I've addressed their alumni uh, as well uh, in, terms of, in, terms, in terms of fundraising. I was last there with Pastor, uh, Pastor Marvin Winans uh, several years ago addressing um, uh, a, a men's program there. And what you, what you were describing, I'll be perfectly uh, frank, is in a stark contrast to what, one, I'm hearing from alumni, two, parents of actual players. You've got parents of players posting uh, stuff on social media saying players are sharing uh, helmets, that there are no showers for the players there, that the players yeah. are washing their own clothes. And so, yeah, right. so I want to do this here. I, wanna, I, I gotta go to this commercial break. Uh, when we come back, I want, if, if we can address that uh, specifically, uh, because there's some of the things I, 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 want, I want you to address uh, and we'll do so. Also, folks, uh, after we finish talking with uh, President Drake, we'll also then be talking with uh, Ed Reed as well. Um, and then, of course, we have some alumni and some other folks who have reached out to us uh, to have a discussion about this. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a back. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. All right, folks, welcome back. We're talking with interim president, Dr. Drake uh, of Bethune Cookman. Dr. Drake, uh, this is a tweet uh, from um, from an individual uh, said, bro, don't tell me nothing about no HBCU. I got kids that played at BC Athletics for the past three years, and they told me they were sharing helmets. Come on, man, stop playing with me. Ed Reed was the best thing for that school. They have the same mentality as the city I'm from, uh, BG. Uh, I, I've also, others have said to me that there are no showers for the players. They're washing their own uniforms and clothes. Is that true? No. And the fact of the matter is, is that, again, I would say you've been to BCU. Come down and visit. I'll show you. Well, actually, here's the deal. I, I, would, I would love to do this here. I would actually love to bring the show down and actually do a town hall on the campus with you, the board, and the students. And in fact, uh, I got to pick up an award from the Trayvon Martin Foundation on February 5th. Uh, and so I would love to do this February 2nd or 3rd. Yeah, we're not, go we're not gonna have the board, and I'll tell you why. When I said earlier, you know, I made the decision, obviously the buck stops at my desk. The board is not charged with the responsibility of making decisions on personnel. That's, that, the that's personnel, but the, but the board does, or the board should be playing a role when it comes to fundraising. The board should they, be playing a role. They should, they should, but again, much of the comments that were made about the board of trustees, frankly, if you were, if I was to put all the board of trustees in that crowd today, 
most of the, those students would not know who they are. And, and that's actually a good thing because that isn't the job of the Board of Trustees. They have three responsibilities, governance, fiduciary, and uh, strategy. That's their three important roles. There are people, My, but, 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 but there are critics who say they're not doing that well, because, because that. of the university issues over the last several years. Well, here's what I would say. I've been at the university for, you know, just under two years. Um, you know, and you also, of course, do work with my alma mater, Fisk University. I could tell you the same things about a lot of places in the HBCU community. Because well, yeah, Fisk has had six presidents in 15 years, and listen, that's a problem. I understand that. And the point is, is that there's all kinds of issues with leadership, um, and we have not sometimes tackled those things as a community. And I'm talking about the black community as it relates to all of our universities. But here what I tell you. You know, it's easy to throw stones as opposed to really being active in trying to make it better. Our university alumni giving, as an example, is extremely low uh, on an annualized basis. So uh, many. Uh, what, what, what's the percentage? It's less than one percent this year. Le le less than one percent this year. If that's that, okay, so the national average is really around four to five percent. We know Claflin is the highest one HBCUs. Why Cla Cla Claflin is fifty percent. So here's a question. Here's a question. Why is that? Is it because is, 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 is alumni giving for Bethune so low because they don't trust leadership? Well, if you go back 25 years, that might you, you might be able to make that statement, except 25 years would say that's not the case because this has been a continuing bell ringer every year. If you look at the alumni giving going back 25 years, you could see alumni giving still somewhere around 11, 12 percent which is not bad. However, in the last decade and a half, it's been less than that. And you say, well, that's, what is that about? Is that because they don't trust leadership? Here's the reality. The fact is, in America, and when you look at the black community in particular, the amount of wealth that we are using and the philanthropic giving back to universities, particularly HBCUs, has been extremely low. It's lower at Fisk. It's lower at a lot of universities. Well, I, I, first of all, first of all, I, I totally understand, Dr. Drake. And look, I've covered yeah. that. I've spoken. You, you that. understand, right? No, no, but no, but but but, but I, 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 no, I understand it. But here's the issue that I have: because we talk about alumni giving, okay? We're talking about a quarter. We're talking about a dollar. So when we're talking about alumni giving, this is not always one percent people giving a thousand dollars. It's literally not even giving a dollar. That's the, correct. The, 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 the reality is, if it used to be eleven or twelve percent. And it's dropped to one percent. There has to be a reason. So has Beth so reason. has Bethune Cookman asked his alumni, "Why have you stopped giving?" Okay, let, what's what's the reason? Let me tell you the reason. The reason is is that when you look at the at the wealth creation of the generation just before us and the one that we're in, the average salaries of most of those people are declining, and their ability to give back has to do with the debt that they're having to amass to go to college in the first. Not even here's the deal. I get it, but. I, I, I've heard that from many different people. Well, the numbers, the numbers are true. I can show you the numbers, you know, but, every way but Sunday. But we're talking about, and again, I get that, but and I get that part. But Dr. Drake, I, you, I, I just, you can't leave out the reality that when Bethune was going through its accreditation issues, its financial issues, I mean, the university was a mess. Folks were talking about yeah. it might close. That also impacts whether or not somebody has the trust to hand over their dollar, even if they got 20 bucks, that they trust is going to be taken care of properly. So here, here's, here's what I'd say to that. If you don't trust it, give it to a student. Give it to a student that can pay their tuition. Make it an unrestricted fund that the university doesn't touch it. It's a pass-through. If you really believe that, that's what you would do. But you see, the point is the narrative can't be one-sided. It can't be that you know, it's all about the university's leadership. It is, a, it is a cultural thing that we have to continue to, you know, change and, and modify and grow. And by the way, in the final analysis, we don't do this work, I don't do this work because I need to be president or because, you know, being president is, is you know, all this and all that. I do this work because it is about the students. At the end of the day, the only reason for the university existing is for those students. And our job, my job, is to figure out the best way to use the resources we have, and in many cases, limited. We're a private HBCU. 
We don't get the kind of funds that even FAMU gets. Your private uh, and their state. Yes. We have to do we have to do everything on the basis of that. So when you talk about a six million dollar impact to your to your revenue base, uh, when you did not budget that, when that wasn't even you know thought about because of two major weather events, and you talk about some buildings that are you know some in some cases twenty to thirty years old, and then you have soil erosion that happens as a result of a massive weather event that you didn't anticipate. Those are not things that the students would consider, and I, I can't say I blame them because they don't know. It's not the context in which they operate. So, so, what, so what are you, so here's the question. Uh, how often are you sharing the information with the students? How often are you talking to them, bringing them along so they actually understand that? That's first. Second of all, when it comes to your university budget, how much of your budget is dependent upon the financial aid of students? 80, 85, 90 percent? What is it? Well, first of all, uh, you asked really three questions, not two. So let me give you the first answer. The first question, the first question I think you asked was, you know, how often do we talk to students? Uh, we have a, a, an SGA. We have a student government. Um, I meet with that student government as often as I can. But most importantly, we have a number of venues in which we talk to students about what's going on. Um, and we offer opportunities for students to be engaged in many ways, whether it's through the Divine Nine, whether it's through SGA. There's all kinds of ways for them to be involved and understand what's going on at the university. Um, so that's one thing. Could we do more of that? Yes, I think we could. And in this situation, I'm going to actually step up my participation in those things because I think it's necessary. It's part of the reason why I'm talking with you tonight. The second question was, you know, what percentage of our budget is actually dependent on tuition? All universities in America, particularly HBCUs, are single source revenue models. That means that the majority of their revenue comes from tuition and fees. Um, the fact of the matter is that those tuition and fees drive everything. Uh, they drive how much you can spend. They drive what your capital budget is. They drive what kinds of things you're able to do. They drive your dining facilities. They drive everything. And so our job is to really try to figure out how we can continue to grow that population and at the same time be able to prioritize the spending. It's, but it's, the, 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 re the, re the reason I ask the question is because yeah. if, if, if your budget is dependent upon that financial aid from the students... Not financial aid. It isn't financial aid. I'm sorry. But the, the, in terms of, obviously, their tuition and what they're spending, what's driving it, those are your customers. Those are, th those are the people you That's absolutely right. have to satisfy and their parents. And if you have these, if you have these students and the parents who right now are saying they're not happy, you've got a problem. Because if uh, they all of a sudden say, hey, we're not going to go to Bethune-Cookman, all of a sudden you see an enrollment drop, your financial pressures are now exacerbated. Well, quite honestly, that's what happened during COVID. Uh, that's what has happened when you have, you're not able to recruit. So during the times we were having financial difficulty, we had that. But here's the other point. The other point is that the university um, has tried to rebound from that, and that doesn't happen in a day. I mean, you, you would know this, I think, as well as anyone, that these endeavors are long-term things. When you're talking about turning around an institution, in some cases, it's like running a startup, and I've done that. It's like being able to go out and raise funds and get people to buy into an idea, which our founder did. She had a I, I get it. Look, look, I ran, I ran, look, I ran, look, I run, I run three black newspapers. I ran Chicago Defender. They lost money for 20 consecutive years. It was called the Chicago Offender. It was awful. I absolutely get it. But the one thing, though, that I, that, that I do understand why, because we had made a profit my second year, about 100 grand, and 400 grand my third year, is that stable leadership, laying out vision, communicating strategy, and then executing was a part of that. And again, I think what's really happening here, and I'll give you the final minute to, uh, to respond to this, is that, and again, I am hearing it. We're going to hear from these folks in a little bit. You have got people who are alumni and students who are upset. I understand there's a lawsuit against uh, your alumni association. Um, is that correct? Well, we're in litigation with not our alumni because that alumni association doesn't exist anymore. We have an alumni. Hold on, hold on. What, hap what, what, what happened to the alumni association? 
Well, first of all, the university decided it was going to go to a different model in terms of its alumni structure, which meant that instead of having chapters, we were going to have you be able to give directly to the university because our chapters weren't raising any money in the old structure. And therefore, we said, okay, we're going to go to a direct relationship model with the university, which most universities in the country have today, 99% of them, including HBCUs. So we changed our model, but what happened is, is that we got into litigation as they started to use some of the trademarks and seals of the university without our permission once it was no longer authorized to do so. So it's not, that's not our alumni association. Here's what I'd also say to you. So you don't actually have an alumni association, right? Yes, now. we do. It's called BCUAA. We have, okay, our, so we, have an, we have an alumni association, which we're not in litigation with. Okay, so what, so the old alumni association, that's what you're in litigation with. That's correct. And when and did the drop take place? You said they weren't raising money before. Are you raising more money now than you? Yes, before? we are. Yes, we are. And the point is this: I got about twenty Direct, seconds. Go a, ahead. DSO, a DSO model is is what we've aspired to. That's what we're doing. We're we're really bringing alumni in and talking to them about the conditions of the institution and what needs to happen. So, you know, there is a faction of alumni, there's a faction of parents. But I can tell you this, when we evacuated that university and we made sure that every student got home safe and we had 32 students from the international that we had to, you know, put uh, in shelter and keep take care of them for until we were able to get them back to campus, the number of letters and calls that I got about, thank you for taking care of my kids, thank you for looking after me. I could only get to campus on the weekend. You, you made the announcement soon enough. We don't hear those stories, and there's a lot of those as well. All right, Dr. Drake, uh, we really appreciate you joining us uh, again. Uh, I am more than willing to bring our show to the campus uh, to do a town hall with you and the students, an alumni. Uh, like I say, I got to be in Florida next week, so you tell me whether f uh, next for Thursday or Friday works. One of those works. We'll do it. I appreciate it, man. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, my producer, we're waiting to hear from you. Appreciate it. Thanks All a lot. All right. Thank you. Folks, got to go to break. We're going to come back. We'll chat with our panel, but we'll also be talking with Ed Reed himself about what took place this weekend at uh, Bethune-Cookman. We also will be talking with uh, a football player there as well as some alumni as well. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Download our app, Apple Phone, Android Phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. We'll be right back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Your money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, a relationship that we have to have. We're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it. That's right. We're talking about our relationship with money. And here's the thing. Our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not. The truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge. Balancing your relationship with your pocketbook. That's next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. 
All right, folks, we're, we're setting up Ed Reed's shot as we speak. Joining us is Dr. Julianne Malvo, Dean at College of Ethnic Studies, California State University, L.A. She also, of course, uh, President Emerita Bennett College at the Amacongo de Benga, Professorial Lecture, School of International Service, American University. Renita Shannon, Georgia State Representative. Glad to have all three of you here. Uh, you know the plight of HBCUs very well. Uh, Julianne, your thoughts about what's happening there at Bethune-Cookman? Well, the alumni giving rate is certainly alarming to have it at 1 percent, having gone down from 11 percent. As you know, HBCU alumni giving rates are not great. Uh, Claflin, of course, being the highest, but 1 percent is pretty pitiful. I mean, that, that's the only way you can put it. Uh, the, I understand the predicament the president finds himself in. I'm looking forward to hearing from the football uh, coach or former coach. Uh, but I do think that there are some issues with image and um, respectability and the politics of respectability at HBCUs, as well as the corporate monies that people have to raise. I mean, this song um, that the coach played on his video is highly inappropriate. Does that warrant a dismissal or the end of conversation? I'm not sure, but I do know that that's just inappropriate. And as the brother said, if 65 percent of the students are women, women, you know, this massage noir that happens uh, toward black women is really disgusting and shouldn't be happening at an HBCU. I, as I said, I'm interested to see what the brother has to say, but I'm troubled by all of this, and especially you and I know we've talked about this before. Many of the problems with our HBCUs are the boards. The board is supposed to raise money. That's the board's job. The board's job is not to get into the Kool-Aid and the weeds around who the football coach is or anything else. The board is supposed to raise money. And so if that board is not operating as a board should operate, there should be some action toward the board as well. I'm a Congo. I think that really at the end of the day, I'm glad that he came on because at the, if he's coming, if Reed is coming on as an employee of the university, and if he's not representing the values from the jump, then I feel like it makes sense. I think it's great that you're having both sides of this come on, Roland, because so many of us out there in the social media world who don't know much about this, we're completely jumping to what happened with Deion Sanders, and this is completely apples and oranges, and it warrants a larger discussion that no other network is going to have. And for you to be able to have that lengthy discussion, I hope more people pick up on it. I'm looking forward to what you're doing going down there, hopefully on the 5th, like you were talking about, or around that time. But the default has to be that we all have to be part of a culture and organization that's working on building Black excellence and respecting Black women. And any organization that's focused on doing that, I'm going to ride with the decisions that they make. Uh, well, why you, I mean, I get respecting women, but uh, it also raises a question for me, do you then govern what music is played at parties? So let's just be real clear here. Okay, it's real easy to say that because what, what you heard in the Ed Reed video, but I can tell you when I was at Fisk University, when I was there, uh, uh, a scholar in residence, I was going to a basketball game. They had the DJ who was out there playing, and they were playing music that the N-word was cussing, dogging women, and folks, students, and other people just walking back and forth. I told him to change the music. And so, again, I get that point. But the question then, do you police it when it's also happening in your dorms? So let's just be, if, if, if we're going to mention it over here and say it's a Christian university, let's see it applied all across the board. Shannon, Ronita, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you are having this discussion tonight because a lot of us do need more details. I will say to your point, I grew up in Florida and the culture of BCC is not one that feels um, super, that feels very much like a Christian university. So I'm kind of not surprised that Ed Reed um, thought that he, his values may align with BCC. I will say that from his videos, I don't know what employer you can talk to that way and think that they are going to be okay with it. So I was not surprised that he got fired. But for the president, some of the things that he mentioned about how he would prefer the students protest other things rather than the university is also very telling. The last and final thing I'll say is growing up in Florida, I survived through many hurricanes. And I'm telling you that the pictures that we just saw of what looks to be mildew or mold, people would have deemed that inhabitable um, after a hurricane to live in that. So, I mean, that is just, those are deplorable conditions. All right, folks, you heard from the interim president, Dr. Drake. Now you get to hear directly from Ed Reed, Hall of Famer. Ed, glad to have you on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Uh, you got a chance to hear what the president had to say on this show. Your response. I mean, I, I honestly, <laughs> I was honestly at the spa, Roland. Um, and when I turned my phone on, that's when I received your text. Um, I didn't hear everything the president had to say. Um, and he's the interim president. Um, I don't feel like he probably would be the person to even 
that would be here. Um, there's a term that is used, you know, with coaches get fired rather than firing head coaches. I've been around this um, a good bit, man. I've been, a, I'm a businessman. And he's probably just a scapegoat to things, man. And, you know, I just woke up to this, man. I honestly, just the first time that I was able to relax. I've been in Daytona for three straight weeks recruiting kids. I have three kids, Dominique Ponder, Jeremy Greaves, and Jordan Johnson, who are... They in school, man. They already in school because they believed in me. Their parents believed in me, man. There's 30 kids that was here on Friday I was with when I got the phone call that they did not want me here. You understand? And I still gave $2,400 out of my own pocket for these young men to go host these kids. And I didn't tell the parents until Saturday morning when Reggie Theus sent the letter to my assistant who was not hired at the time, because none of my people were hired, and saying that, tell Ed to withdraw his name. He wanted me to say this. I have the email. You want me to say that I'm withdrawing my name so you can save yourselves. I'm not here for nothing but these kids. I apologize for the unprofessionalism. This is what I've been teaching these young men. What these young men and young women did today is for them, man. That's powerful, man. That's that's old school things, man. I'm not here to bash this university. I know what Dr. McLeod has built. I've been researching it since they called me. In 1904, when she started this university with five young kids, it was built on education. I wasn't here to bash this university. I saw all the things that were going on. I have the tapes. My people and I have been shooting the documentary for the longest. I'm not here to bash Bethune Cookman. I was still trying to get back to the job today. <sighs> I have a foundation I've been running for 20 years, man. 20 years to work with kids. I built a park in my own neighborhood. You understand? Because kids are dying. This ain't right. This ain't right, man. For Mr. Lawrence Drake, Dr. Drake, to come on and talk about me in that way. I knew this was a Christian school. I knew that. I'm a Christian, man. I, I've... I know I played music, but you do do you see? He said he walked campus every day, right? I don't believe that. Because if you walk campus every day, you'll see what these young folk wear to school, man. You will see this. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? They 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 worse than the songs. You have crackheads walking through campus, man. There's no security for these young women and men. I'm not trying to bash the school. We were picking up trash when I was screen recorded. I didn't post that. Somebody screen recorded me and put that out there because they said I was mutting the school. I'm not mutting the school. We're picking up trash. At the time, you're telling me I'm mutting the school. I'm on the ground grabbing trash from under trees behind bushes because my football team was acting too cute. Don't interview me. Interview them kids. Interview the team. Interview these young women and men. I'm not here for... Man, I got a 40-year-old son who I've been missing his stuff for three weeks. I'm tired, man. This is exhausting, man. They lying on me, man. Why lie on me, man, to save your face, man? Because you're doing something wrong. You understand me? I took families to a basketball game. This man, Reggie Theus, man, this man is evil, man. You're evil, man. This man is evil, dude. I take parents to a basketball game. You understand me? And he don't come out during the warm-up at all. The parents are like, where's the coach? Then when you do come out, man, you got another man fixing your pants, man. <sighs> Bro, I'm not rolling. I'm not 
like, bro, I'm not with these people and portraying me to be in the people who know me know I'm not like that, man. Yeah, I speak with passion. Have you ever seen my speech from Florida State game when they are, we, we, we were winning? And I gave that speech. I respect everything Dr. McLeod built this thing on. I showed the team the video. You understand me? I showed the team the video after I saw it on Martin Luther King's birthday before the day when everybody celebrate him. I cry for them kids, man. I hurt for them kids because it's wrong. I got eight, eight kids that committed the week before. These kids calling me, their parents calling me. What are we going to do? I can't get these kids in no school. I can't have these kids uncommitted and go somewhere else. And you telling me I'm, I'm withdrawing? No, I'm not withdrawing. I still want to coach here and coach these kids after all this going on. And I'm wrong, Roland? Come on, man. Come on, man. And y'all know y'all y'all know what's right. Roland, you know what's right. You know that man on here lying. His scapegoat. This man, the interim president. I've been doing this, man. I just left University of Miami where I was the chief of staff. Make it a lot more with less responsibilities. I got a six-figure job on internet working for the 33rd. I didn't need this. I'm financially stable, and I was teaching them young men how to be gentlemen, you understand? I'm, I'm putting a napkin on their lap in front of their parents. The night they call me, interview these parents. Interview the parents. Wait, hold, Ed, hold tight one second. I'm going to a break because we do have three players coming up a little bit later. So I got a two-minute break. I want to come back. I got a couple more questions for you. But we are talking to players and alumni as well. Folks, we're talking about this whole two-hour show today is focusing on what's happening at Bethune-Cookley. We just talked to the interim president after Drake. We're now talking to Ed Reed, uh, who, uh, who was supposed to be the head football coach there. But the president said he made the decision to rescind that offer. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really want to have this conversation. No, they don't. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. An hour of living history with Dr. Richard Mariba Kelsey, thinker, builder, author, and one of the most important and impactful elders in the African-American community. He reflects on his full and rich life and shares his incomparable wisdom about our past, present, and future. African genius is, is, is saying that my uncle was a genius, my brother was a genius, my neighbor was a genius. I think we ought to drill that in ourselves and move ahead rather than believing that I got it. That's next on The Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We're talking about a Bethune-Cookman University. It's been lots of drama. Ed Reed was a lot of focus and attention when he made the decision. It was announced he would become the head football coach there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when he uh, shared his thoughts about the campus and conditions, uh, people began to talk. And then this weekend, uh, the decision was made by the president. He said he made the decision uh, not to move forward with Ed Reed. Uh, Ed released his statement saying, look, they had pretty much worked all 
the contract details out. But the president said uh, he simply did not align with their values. Uh, and joining us right now uh, is Ed Reed. Ed, clearly we see your emotion uh, and, and how you feel in the passion when you uh, told told those young men on Saturday, Deion Sanders came onto uh, your live stream as well, offering you words of encouragement. Um, in a moment, we're going to talk to three football players. Uh, these players have actually signed a petition asking you to be reinstated. You saw the student protest uh, there today. Uh, the president talked about being a Christian university. He talked about uh, it was the music that you were playing that was on when you, when you were live. Uh, and, and he also just talked about uh, that the criticism uh, that you that you level as well. But he did say uh, Disney and other people, other donors called and said, hey, what, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but you were talking to folks. You were actually communicating with uh, a number of uh, high, uh, high net worth uh, people. Uh, I saw one report, uh, and just let me know if it's true, that Shaquille O'Neal and other athletes, you were lining up other athletes uh, to financially support uh, Bethune Cookman. Share with folks uh, the kind of things that you were already putting in place to financially help the institution build. The one lie that Mr. Dr. Drake came on here and said that I did here is you asked him about locker rooms. These kids do not have locker rooms. They don't have showers. They wash their own clothes. You understand me? The donors I had is irrelevant at this point. I had plenty of support. I asked them to get out of the way because I understood where I was coming from. I'm from Shrewsbury, Louisiana. That's five minutes out of New Orleans. I'm from a brickyard. I grew up in one bedroom apartment with five kids in it. You understand me? I'm from right where we at right now. You understand? Yeah, Shaq called me. FaceTime me. Little bro, I got you. You understand? And plenty more who supported me. The man's name is on a building who pulled up and had me in his car and asked me, what do I need? This man got who knows how much money. He got all restaurants around here. Plenty of other people in the community. I don't need to name these people because they don't need to be put on this platform. We had the support. All I needed them to do was get out of the way. Don't have your hand in the pockets of football. That's the problem here. Probably. I don't know. Because I was moving too fast. So I went to Baltimore. I got drafted to Baltimore, and I went into Baltimore community as I'm still working in Baltimore community with Booker T. Washington. You understand me? The worst school that I ever seen in the, in Baltimore. Yeah, the wire was true because they right across the street from abandoned buildings. You hear me, Ro? That's Sir. where they at. That's where they at. I still work with this school. Abandoned buildings across the way. And you tell, man, boy, this hurt, boy. This hurt, bro. I can't believe this, man. I can't, man, because I know I'm not wrong, man. Yeah, I was wrong for the post. My boy, my homeboy post, the second post, with the music on it, he did that. That's what they do. But these kids listen to that, as y'all alluded to. These kids listen to that music, man. Come on, man. I'm a Miles Davis, Frankie Beverly. You know me. If they know me, I'm a DJ. <laughs> I got people know what I like to listen to. My 30th birthday, I had Frankie Beverly and Maze there, man. My dad and my parents raised me right. But these people, this is a total di different generation, man. That old mentality ain't nothing wrong with I respect my elders, man. I'm not on here to bash nobody. But you're not going to get on no way. You ain't going to get on no platform and talk about me, what I'm doing wrong. No, my brother. So Reed, It's not that. Reed, let, let, let me let me chime in. Roll them we appreciate you. I'm, I'm Ro Parrish. I work closely with Ed, and we've had a number of conversations today. I'm sorry, hold to... on. You said, I'm sorry, you said, what's your name again? Ro, Ro Parrish. Got it. I, I, Got it. I'm a part of Ed's uh, team here. Got it. And 
we've been in contact with you know, people uh, with the administration, with Bethune Cookman, to extend an olive branch because, as you can see, my brother is extremely passionate, but that passion comes from the love that he has for the kids to try to instruct them, not only on the football field. One of our messages is it's bigger than football. And we've been instructing, you know, these recruits that have come in, the former players, to, to teach them more outside of the game of football. But like I was saying, we've extended an olive branch to the administration. Yes. To, to come back and, you know, give us the opportunity. We know that he's passionate, but he put the passion before the purpose, and now we want I to I didn't. It. The purpose was on, bro. I know y'all. I know what y'all saying because, right. of the, right. because of the post, right? Right. It was not that, bro. Because like I said, man, I was here cleaning up with the kids. So how the passion come before the purpose? When we were doing the purpose, as I spoke about it, Right? Like I said, I went to Baltimore and I worked with Booker T. Washington, right? I went in this neighborhood and I talked to people years ago, years back. And this man said, my mother was struck out on drugs. My daddy wasn't in my life. And when I heard you came to Bethune Cookman, I had to come over here. He said, what do you need? I said, man, we need everything. He was like, I be more specific. I need you to cut this grass. Man, we chop down trees. They chop down trees. They they mowed lawns. They still excavating the land right now where the practice facilities was going to be where it should have been years ago while I work in this prison building, my office space, with none of the windows open. You understand me? So so one thing that we did have when one of the initiatives was to have a practice field actually on campus, something that Bethune-Cookman doesn't currently have right they now. They bust to the so, stadium so, which, which is practice. Which is not what you want for any respect. You're wasting money doing that. Now. I'm trying to save so, money. So, so Ed and our team had got together. We had started breaking ground and removing debris from the area to start a practice. Where the homeless people were staying. You understand? Homeless people were staying in those trees where these young ladies, track team, Basketball, football, they they ice outside of there. So the thought hit me. What if one of these homeless men have a mental breakdown? I stopped a homeless man from walking across the parking lot. He was here. I said, man, you can't be in here. He asked one of the players for change, and the kid gave it to him because the gate is broke, right? The gate's broke. So there's a, there's a, there's a number of things that, that we've... Uh, wanted to do with Bethune-Cookman practice field, adding the locker room. We have the resources. We have the ability to do it. We just were encountering so many roadblocks in order to make these things happen. And let me just add another thing. A lot of these things that we were doing, uh, we have assistance from our team, of course, but Ed was financing a lot of this out of his own pocket. And, and that's something that hasn't really been spoken about, but the passion that he has for these kids Yes, he did not have his contract, but he was that dedicated. And when you have a, a gentleman's agreement in place, when you come to terms and nothing signed formally, but you agree that you will do business together, most people act in good faith. And yes, we know about the rent. Everything that was said probably wasn't professional, but at the same time, it needed to be said. It wasn't professional, but needed to be said. The point is, especially at this point, I'm sorry. We, we, we wanted to do everything possible to make change and to put the focus on the kids, give them an, exper an experience. So when they came to Bethune Cookman, they saw that we were a, do first, this, man. a first class program and that we were about business. But again, it's, people were it's, throwing off ships. It's, they hung on these old trees, man. They hung on these old trees, man. The Ku Klux Klan showed up to the school when Dr. McLeod was here. How can you do this? This is wrong, man. These kids deserve better, and I was giving it to them. And I still want to because I got three kids here right now, and they only want to play for me. They only came for me. They can't go no other school. How, man? Dr. Drake, you wrong, man, don't do that. Ro, you said you extended the olive branch. Um, do you believe there is a pathway for you, Ed, Dr. Drake, to sit down 
and move forward and repair what um, what has been broken? The, the, the one thing I asked for, we, myself and Ed sat down today and, and all we requested was just to have a, a conversation because there's a lot of things that we want to do. Our visions are aligned as far as the administration, the athletic program. We all want the same thing. True. But, but, but it starts True. with the conversation. We requested that. So True. far, we, we haven't been granted that access. We're still waiting to see if that's possible. Uh, but we stuck around on purpose. We had recruits here this weekend. Certain members of, of the athletic program wanted us to cancel the visit while uh, it was going on. And again, Reggie Diaz, man, say his name, man. I, I'll ask you this here, Ro. Have other have other HBCUs reached out to y'all? We've been in contact with other H, uh, head coaches from HBCUs. I turned down the Jackson State job to come here, Roland Martin. Jackson State called, Brown called me. Deion Sanders called me himself, man. Gave me. So, so every, listen, everything is that Ed is saying is, is accurate. There have been other offers before Bethune Cookman in previous years from other. Grambling. From, uh, from, bro. Calm. Oh, I'm sorry, bro. From, from other HBCUs, there, there's been opportunities for Ed to be a head coach at, at multiple colleges. This was a, a, an opportunity, the location, the campus, everything about Bethune-Cookman was extremely appealing, which led him to ultimately choosing this over the opportunity at other institutions. Uh, I came here. I was impressed. We hadn't seen everything but just the lay of the land, the campus, the location and proximity to the beach. We thought this would be a great opportunity, especially being in Florida, too very uh, familiar with Florida, obviously playing at the University of Miami and going on to work for the uh, Hurricanes after his playing days. So we looked at it as a great opportunity. And unfortunately, there were so many roadblocks that got in the way. But but again, the focus right now, first is the kids, but it's just to start with yeah, the conversation. Man. That's it. You know, we, we're still here. Like I said, we didn't leave. We got this news Friday that they wanted Ed and his team to exit. We stuck around. We had the recruits close to close to 30 families. We hosted them. We treated them to dinner. And, and we have plenty of receipts. We opened the bar yesterday. We, we, Saturday night for them. We, we, we've, we've done everything. And, well, they gave and them box lunches, a $30 voucher, man. Ed, Ed has led the way in... in um, <laughs> One of the recruits' families had a flat tire Sunday morning. He tells me to pull D up. DJ, <laughs> DJ, man. You know, he, 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 he's, 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 he, he's no longer technically responsible for these families. However, he made sure that their tire got repaired. He threw the, the tire in the front seat of my vehicle. It was and, a Porsche. And, <laughs> tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. It was a Porsche. We, we, but, but we figured it out. And, and I say all that to say is the passion is evident. We see that. Don't let the message get misinterpreted. The... The, the passion that he has is all for the kids to show them that they can have success mm -hmm. starting with obviously playing football, but it's bigger than football. And it's just my, so much more, man. My, 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 my partner right here, he just wants the best for the university and the kids. And like I said, we extended the olive branch. We still haven't heard anything yet from anybody in administration. Okay. Uh, however, all we were asking for before we exited Daytona is just to have a conversation. I am, uh, again, uh, you may have heard me ask the president there, I am more than happy to bring this show to uh, Daytona, to do a town hall there uh, on the campus with the students, with the administration, with the alumni, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, that conversation will take place if he decides to stick to his decision, uh, if that's it, or if there is some way to reconcile, we'll see what happens there. Uh, I, gentlemen, I thank both of you, Ed. I appreciate uh, you coming on the show. Ro, thank you very well for, uh, for your input. Uh, coming up next, we got three, of, you, three of those players, uh, Bethune-Cookman players, uh, who are going to share their thoughts. Ed, you said talk to the players. Well, they're next right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black 
own media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, a relationship that we have to have. We're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it. That's right. We're talking about our relationship with money. And here's the thing. Our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not. The truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge. Balancing your relationship with your pocketbook. That's next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. All right, folks, joining us right now are three of the football players uh, at Bethune-Cookman. Those players have actually signed, uh, I think it's about 30 or so, signed a petition uh, asking the university to rescind their decision to bring Ed Reed uh, back uh, to the university. Uh, Jaden Bivens, the student athlete, Austin uh, Yankawi, hope I pronounced that correctly, let me know, and Anthony Frederick, uh, glad to have all three of you here. First, are all three of you football players? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, so uh, first off, uh, you've heard the, the interim president on the show. You heard Ed Reed there. Just share with our, share with our audience just uh, your thoughts on when he gave you the news that, uh, that they, were, they were terminating him. And what do you want the administration to know uh, as it relates to uh, Ed Reed uh, for you being uh, remaining the head football coach at Bethune-Cookman? All right, I got it. Um, so... The importance to that is that Coach Reed in three weeks has essentially done more than this entire administration and other um, program leads, like other head coaching staffs and whatnot. He's done more in three weeks than they have in like of the past five years. Um, things that you know, Coach Drake mentioned saying that we didn't share helmets, we don't shower, or we we sh we actually have showers. We don't have showers. We don't have a locker room. We have to watch out where we put our stuff in the stadium locker room so it doesn't get wet and then get moldy, and then we got to practice in moldy stuff. Or when we go and put our stuff away, it's in a we shed. put it in the shed, and, the shed and then the shed the gets wet from the rain, yeah. and then we got to practice in that moldy stuff. Moldy balls, moldy helmets. We share those moldy helmets too, and that gear. Most of us had to buy our own uh, Lysol and stuff to yeah. spray we our. We had, we had to, we had to clean our stuff ourselves. Uh, once we get our gear from um, the equipment manager from that shed, it smelled bad. Uh, I remember the first time uh, I opened my bag, and uh, yeah, most of the guys were just like, yeah. what's, "What's going on?" Um, we asked if we could like we 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 asked for the basics. We asked if we could get you know stuff to spray our stuff down, and um, that Could've probably didn't happen that. until like <laughs> the very very end. Yeah, we got that maybe uh, week eight was when we got that. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure on week five was when we actually had uh, the mold outbreak in our helmets and gear. And in my in my gloves alone, I didn't wear gloves at practice because it literally just smelled like the epitome of mold. Like I was just smelling a handful of mold. And um, what makes this even worse is that uh, we had to deal with the conditions when we were displaced. That was even worse. And I know that Anthony was here uh, for the entire world tour, is what we call it as a nickname. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were we would spend 16-hour days with the football team. 16 hours. I have the receipts on that because I have the old screenshots of our schedule. And we would go from 8 o'clock all the way until 10.30. Our off day would be considered. Uh, yeah. So awesome. one of the one of the yeah. bus drives was considered as an off day. So we were on the bus for 16 probably. 16 hours. Yep, 16 hours stuck on there. By the time we got there, it was probably like, I want to say. 1.30. Yeah, it was about 1. Uh, we got some food. 
Um, and then after that, it was, you know, we got we went to bed. Then the next morning, we wake up, uh, meetings and everything, go eat breakfast. That's the normal day. Like, yep. we, like we didn't just drive 16 hours and get there at 1.30. The president said that, look, Bethune-Cookman has had faced a couple of hurricanes, uh, that there are um, that? obviously financial issues. And he said that uh, when he said, look, he walks the campus every single day uh, and, and, and he sees and hears what the students. And I said, well, you know, how, what are you sharing with the students? What, how are you talking to those students? And he said, hey, you know, we should, do, we should do more of that. Of course, you heard him ask me to visit. And I said, look, I'll be happy to come to a town hall there uh, because it, it's abundantly clear. It's abundantly clear there is a disconnect uh, between what he is saying and what y'all are saying. Go ahead. So he said he's been here for under uh, two years, just right under two years. Right. And since he's been here, I've been, I'm a freshman. I've been here since the last semester and this semester. So it's going on almost a year now. And I've never seen him uh, walk. I'm, this is my first time seeing him on this. Mm -hmm. I've never seen him in person in the flesh walking on this campus. I've never spoke to him. I didn't even know that he was the interim president. To <laughs> Me my, and Anthony have never seen him until we saw him at the, the classic, classic speaking on the, at the banquet. Yep, That I'm is never, when we first met him. On top of that, if he wants to really talk about how he comes on to campus and he understands students and he gets mad at Coach Reed for music, you understand we play that on campus every day. With DJs. People dress very, very, very you know. It's that's, that's, that, I don't know if y'all heard that. That's why I was saying to my panel, again, yeah. I, look, I, I've 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 been, I've been on 65 HBCU campuses, and so I'm like, okay, I hear you, Doc, but I know what I hear, and so if you're gonna object to what you say Ed was playing or what was the music, then you are are you doing checks all around campus? Because I know what I hear. And he's an interim president too, so he's kind of a non-factor. You know what I mean? In my opinion, when it comes to us as student athletes and as students, if you're gonna actually come in and, you know, if you're gonna actually do the community service with us, you know what I mean? We didn't see you at all. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't see like, you, not like, one time, pick up any trash around here, not come around at all. So why, why aren't you come and do that with us? Because you know that that's something that could help with a lot of things bring the campus together, which we mm -hmm. did by ourselves. You know what I mean? We did that all by ourselves. A I had Sunday. a food truck come in and give free food out for everybody who was done who was who was done picking up the trash with us. But then yeah, also right. campus security got called up on my on my food truck and it's the first time it's ever happened to that food truck and they got moved from the location. We had to go out and buy our own uh, garbage bags. Yeah, um, we had to buy our own garbage bags. They wouldn't let it, they wouldn't they wouldn't let they us wouldn't into let us athletic in our center. Own facility. The uh, campus security said they got their keys taken away to the ATC. We could all we wanted to go in there and get was trash garbage bags, bags and, gloves. and gloves. That's it. That's all we wanted. And and I was one of the first people to get there at the ATC, and I was just standing there, and you know, people started walking up, and I was kind of like, "Are you guys athletes? Are you guys, you know?" And they were like, "No, we're here to help. We're here, we're here, you know, because we saw you guys picking up trash. We saw Ed Reed doing it, and and we want to be a part of it. Every you 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 see the videos, you see the you see the pictures. Everybody was having a good time when we were doing it. He was on live with us. We got to say hi to him, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that kind of change is something that you don't really see a lot anymore. I mean, some, some, um, what, some, some other people might, you know. Yeah, they, they, I mean, we had, we had a, a lot of people come by. We had volleyball, track, basketball, and girls basketball, and I think we had baseball too. Other organizations and too. Other organizations, we had every frat come out. Yep. We had uh, sororities coming out. We had, uh, the entire student body was there on Sunday. And, you know, that really, shows us that we can all come together as a campus. But the thing is, is that no one, and I mean no one from staff, administration or anything, came out and helped. No one else came out and said, oh yeah, they, they're doing community service. You definitely would saw, see it on Twitter because you you saw me speaking and, and talking and tweeting and I've already hit over 100,000 views. I know you saw me. And I know you saw that we scheduled community service and we scheduled, you know, whatever we scheduled. and you didn't come out and represent, you know, the school itself as a staff or administration. At your rally, at the rally today, students were saying that uh, the, the board needs to go. You heard President Drake say uh, the board doesn't need to be, if we do a town hall, the board doesn't need to be there um, in terms of laying out what their issues are. 
But one, he's still the interim. The board is going to determine whether he get that t tag removed or if they bring a, in a new president. And so have y'all formally requested a meeting with the board of trustees uh, and to discuss the, these issues? Well, this is bigger than just the football team. Yeah, it's it's you know, uh, not just us. No, 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 just, no, 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 no. But when I say y'all, I'm meaning not just football team, meaning student bodies saying, I, hey, we want to hear from the ministry the, that y'all want to talk to the administration and the board of trustees so they understand your feelings. Yes, we sir. A lot, a lot, a lot of a lot of like SGA um, and a lot of the people that have those titles that have that, the, that, those connections to be able to reach out to them have been trying and trying and. Um, Today is probably the first day where we started to kind of get like a little bit of leeway, but at the same time, it's like these are the kind of situations where if they let the students have a voice, this 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 situation wouldn't be wouldn't be happening, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's sad, but it's the truth. Uh, everything we're saying. It, if we were heard right away, this wouldn't be an issue. But the um, thing is, is that they don't want us to be heard because there's something else going up on top that's happening that we don't know about, that we don't fully understand, but we know it's happening. Because you can see that with a 100% acceptance rate and a 33% graduation rate, there's obviously something wrong. And you're bringing in more freshmen. You brought in your biggest freshman hall of the year, of, of all years, but you're cutting senior scholarships. So they're having to come, that don't out, make no come out of pocket. Yeah, and it's coming out of their pockets yeah. now. You, you want money. That's what you want? You want money. Well, gentlemen, um, look, uh, I hope the president accepts my invitation uh, to do this campus-wide uh, town hall. Uh, certainly, I hope that the Board of Trustees and the administration sits down with students and communicates more. Uh, we are going to uh, definitely continue to cover this. Uh, we had some other alumni members. We're going to have them on. We're going to have some other folks on as well. I appreciate the three of you coming on, sharing your thoughts and concerns. And, and I can promise you uh, this will be not the last time that we talk about what's happening at Bethune-Cookman. And so I can't speak for any other media, but uh, I own this. And I can guarantee you we will continue uh, to shine the light on what's happening there uh, and continue to press for answers uh, that, you, that you guys are demanding. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate that. Coach Reed, we got you. I yes, appreciate sir. it, gentlemen. Thanks a lot. Folks, got to go to a break. We come back. Uh, my panel shared their thoughts. We'll also talk with uh, the alumni president of Bethune-Cookman. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, I'm sure you've heard that saying that the only thing guaranteed is death and taxes. The truth is that the wealthy get wealthier by understanding tax strategy. And that's exactly the conversation that we're gonna have on the next Get Wealthy, where you're going to learn wealth hacks that help you turn your wages into wealth. Taxes is one of the largest expenses you ever have. You really gotta know how to manage that thing and get that under control so that you can build wealth. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really wanna have this conversation. No, they don't. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm going to go back to my panel. Uh, I'll start with you, Julian. Uh, you heard Ed Reed there. You, you saw the passion. You, you heard uh, how, how he feels. And even with what, ha what has happened, he says he's, he still wants to mend fences and to help these students. You heard those three young men as well. Uh, just your thoughts uh, with what has transpired. Well, it's really challenging that You've got three, um, he mentioned three people that he recruited. They came to play with him, you know, under his leadership, and now he's gone. So that's really challenging and it's heartbreaking for the students 
as well as for their parents. They made certain plans. I don't know if these young people can play at another college if he's not reinstated. So that, if we start with the students and how the students are impacted. Also looking at those young brothers talking about buying their own garbage bags, cleaning their own things. I mean, in direct opposition to what the president said. Um, so I just questions to raise about the president. And as you didn't, as you said, I've been a president. I know you can't please all the people all the time. But this seems like such a gap between the experience the young people are having and the experience that the president is sharing. So the last young man who said there's something else going on, I have a tendency to agree with him. I don't know what the finances are. Um, at Bethune, he says that they're stable. And the fact that they got a 10-year reaffirmation is amazing. That's good. That's really hard to get. So I'm happy for them for that. But you've got to serve the students. And that's what HBC Land ought to be about. We always talk about, oh, we serve the students. But oftentimes, we look at the data, and the data just doesn't show some of that. So the, the situation, Roland, breaks my heart. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you for taking the time to hear both sides, for lifting this story up. Because what you, if you look at, I mean, I saw Bill Roden had a piece on the undefeated. Um, a couple other people have written. And it just seems that there's a lack of knowledge. And we're getting the facts with this, which I just, I'm really grateful for. And I'm sure the parents and the students are as well. Appreciate that. Uh, when we start this show off, we had about 1,500 folks who uh, are watching on YouTube. We now are uh, more than 5,000. And so word has been spreading. So people definitely want answers. Uh, Renita, it's, it's a whole lot to unpack here. Uh, you heard interim president talk about uh, the, the need for $250 million. But then he talked about how you had alumni giving that was 11 and 12 percent, now down to 1 percent. And, and I understand his, re his answer. And every time I've raised this issue, people try to come back at me saying, well, black folks ain't got this, ain't got that, and how much money we don't have. I keep trying to explain to people, and, and, and Julian knows this very well. When we talk about alumni giving, we're not talking about people who are giving $100 or more or $1,000 or more. We're talking about giving a dime. And if your alumni giving, and I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Drake and the board trustees, if your alumni giving goes from 12% to 1%, that is an absolute indictment against leadership of the university. There's no other, you cannot tell me, well, that's because the income of black folks dropped. No, if you went from 12 to six, no, you went from 12 to one. You got the deep, you, we can sit here and, you know, again, that, that scene from Scandal, I love what Joe Morton says to Olivia Pope, you know, you're running around like it's a field of daisies where bombs are blowing up all around you. There's a fundamental problem here, and if you don't get to the root issue and then instill trust in alumni, then you're going to have a problem. Right. And obviously there are some fundamental problems with what is going on at BCC. I mean, regardless of whether or not alumni is giving and regardless of whether or not you have the money, what I'm hearing in these interviews from the president to Ed Reed to the students who you just allowed to speak, which I'm sure they're really grateful, uh, there's a lot of the president disputing the poor conditions at BCC. So if they can't even agree on basic facts where you have Ed saying this is how it is, the students are saying this is how it is, and even people in the comments on YouTube as this show is uh, taping, students are coming on commenting saying, this is true, we are dealing with these conditions. And then you have the president saying, no, this isn't true. That right there is a large fundamental issue. And I think right now too much of this is being blamed on, well, there is a culture mismatch between Ed and the university. But I will say this, I used to go to the classic all the time um, when I was in high school and I do not remember witnessing a lot of praying going on. So this is not about culture. This is about a fundamental disconnect on the real life experience of the of the students who are attending that university and experiencing these conditions and an administration who is unwilling to hear their voice, as the student said, and unwilling to um, recognize what is going on. I'm a Congo. Uh, I was uh, when I was in St. Louis this weekend and I was Tef Poe and I were talking and uh, and he was saying, man, the one thing I really appreciate what you do with your show, how transparent you are when it comes to, yo, this, how much this costs, this, how much this costs, things along those lines. I am a firm believer in the sharing of information. In fact, uh, Anthony, you should you get this. Y'all, this here is a uh, is a post of Ida B. Wells Barnett. 
Uh, this is an art piece. And this is her most famous quote uh, that she always, that, that, that's a tribute to her that she always used. And it said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. That's her quote. And I was, I was, I'll, I'll say this here to, to Bethune-Cookman or any other HBCU or any other black institution. If people are saying there are problems, you have to be transparent with people about the problems. And as, Ju as Julian just said and Renita just said, if I'm sitting here and the president's saying, well, no, the players uh, don't wash their own clothes, but I just talked to three players. I, for me, somebody ain't telling the truth or don't know the truth or is misrepresenting the truth. And so what needs to happen is, again, across the board, what is the state? When, once, when somebody tells me, hey, okay, you know what? We changed our alumni association. Alumni giving is up. Okay, I want to hear a number. What does that mean? What, what, what is it? Be transparent with the people because here's the reality. There are people who want to help. But I can tell you now, no one is willing to hand you a check if they can't trust you are going to properly take the money and use it wisely. You are you're right, 100%. And even going back to what you were saying when we were talking about it in the first segment, when you were just talking about the hypocrisy, because I mentioned the whole thing about, he says, you know, we want to make sure we're building a, an organization that respects black women. And like you said, well, it has to be a, a total effort to do that. And that's not happening on the campus. It's the same with everything else that you just said. There's a serious disconnect when you have a, a interim president who comes on and says all of these beautiful things that are happening on the campus and all the efforts that they're making, but the people on the ground are living an entirely different reality. So clearly when he's talking about being on the campus and being seen, he has no presence. And we're talking about kids with mold on their helmets. So we're talking about long-term health issues. And when we come back to this financial thing, one of the challenges that I'm seeing with, with Mr. Reed is that this brother was ser is seriously committed to helping redirect the culture of the entire university with a hands-on approach. And this kind of goes to what Dr. Malvo was saying in the first segment. Sometimes these presidents and boards are, are blocking these things. And so when you're talking about town hall meetings, when you're talking about the transparency as it relates to the money, that student said that there's a, and we can check the facts, Whatever. He said it's 100% admission rate, but 33% graduation rate. These students are being let down by the conditions they are forced to live in. And that is serious, pretty problematic. And when you just said, Roland, some people have concerns cutting the check. Listen to what Mr. Reed was saying. People, he, he only mentioned Shaq, but he had other people who were lined up to help give this university a leg up, a boost up, and now that's going to go away. And I think that's part of the main reason why some of these other places, like Disney and stuff, might be shying away as well, because a bigger light has been broadcast on this university. And it's really tragic. And our students, man, when, as a professor myself, it all starts and ends with the students. And to see the way that these students are being let down by their leadership, they're literally saying, I have not seen you. That's a recipe for disaster. And they need immediate change. And these students need to continue to speak up. Oh, and well, they need to let this off. They need to have a meeting to see what they can do to work something out. Mr. Reed came on here, national television, and apologized for anything he might have done wrong. I didn't hear anything from the interim president. He wants to make this happen. Make something happen, damn it. And what I also, and, and this is what immediately jumps out, and Julian, again, leading Bennett, you know this. Okay, Disney. See, see, I, see, I, see, I, see I'm about to go there. All right, Disney, what's the size of the check y'all write to beat Bethune-Cookman annually? What, what's the, in, in fact, well, let me just do this here real quick just for the folk. How much time I got before I go to break? Okay, got it. All right, let me show you, just so y'all understand, and again, I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate, um, you know, uh, what folk do and things along those lines. But um, y'all do know that uh, Black Panther 2 is a Disney movie. And it's a whole bunch of black folks who went to go see Black Panther 2. These, these are the latest numbers uh, right here. Right here. Black Panther 2 has grossed $840 million worldwide. 
The first one crossed the billion dollar mark. This will eventually cross uh, cross a uh, billion dollars. And so I get somebody at Disney calling saying, what you gonna do about this here? But again, what's Disney's check? What, what's the size of Disney's annual check to Bethune Cookman? It is abundantly clear here that uh, there are people who are confused, who are angry, who are upset. And again, the history is the history. The numbers, Bethune was close to shutting down. The finances were awful. Accreditation issues, leadership issues, calls for the board to be completely replaced. A successful president gets fired. Interim president, folks coming in and out. If it is stabilized, got it. But it is clear, well, from what we're hearing, that the students and the alumni, they need more answers than they are getting. And I certainly hope that President Drake accepts our invitation, invites us to campus on February 2nd or 3rd. We will happily bring this show there to the campus and do a town hall to talk about what's happen happening at Bethune-Cookman and give folks a voice. Got to go to break. We come back. We hear from the alumni leader of Bethune-Cookman right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Blood and soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. It's an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. next a balanced life with me dr jackie a relationship that we have to have we're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it that's right we're talking about our relationship with money and here's the thing our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not the truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge balancing your relationship with your pocketbook that's next on a balanced life with me dr jackie here at black star network all right, welcome back to Roller Mart Unfiltered. Joining us right now is Johnny McCrae, Jr., president of the Mayor McLeod Bethune National Alumni Association, uh, and Charles Cherry, the president and CEO of 623 Management, Inc., uh, ad agency, also the former publisher of the Daytona Times and Florida Courier. Uh, he wrote a piece uh, calling for the Board of Trustees to all go uh, in 2021. Johnny, I want to go to you. So is, is your alumni association, is this the old association or the current one the president was talking about? This is the old association. Uh, we re renamed ourselves to the Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune National Alumni Association. Said the president, interim president Drake said the reason it was, it was they were dissolved or it was unsanctioned, whatever, is that, that you had chapters and y'all were not raising money for the university. Let me say this. In law, we have a term that's called subterfuge. That's a subterfuge. The real answer is, and this is uh, evident in Ed Reed's situation, anytime you have someone who's willing to speak out, Bethune Cookman will seek to silence you, destroy you, or separate itself from you. Ed Reed was engaged in a rant, but he raised the same issue, some of the same issues that the Alumni Association raised in a very professional letter to the board. We asked for transparency. We asked for accountability. We simply asked that a national search firm be engaged 
to bring in a qualified president. They would not meet with us, and the board chair actually said, who are we to tell the board what to do? What happened, Roland, about three or four months later, we get a cease and desist letter. And after that, three or four months later, we have a federal lawsuit filed against us saying that we're using the uh, logos of, of the school in the 90-some years that this alumni association has existed. We've never, ever had any issues with using the intellectual property of the school. So it comes from the university wanting to silence individuals. All of the administrators, the staff, the faculty, and even the students of Bethune-Cookman are required to sign, uh, sign confidentiality agreements. What are they trying wait, to wait, 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 wait. Students are required to sign confidentiality agreements? That's what I'm told, and today an alumnus called me and actually said that one of the students asked her, are the alumni required to sign confidentiality agreements? That is the marching order at Bethune-Cookman right now. Everyone is petrified about speaking out, and all this alumni association ever did was raise salient questions that impacted this university. Charles, you wrote this piece right here on March 18, 2021. Go to my iPad, please, uh, where you said the HBCU needs new board leadership. In this particular column, ran the Florida Courier, uh, you laid out what happened. Uh, this is the uh, board chair, uh, for, for retired judge, uh, uh, Belvin Perry. You laid out how they fired a successful president, uh, and then, because you laid out uh, uh, LeBrent Cripe, who frankly uh, brought the university back to life, and that uh, Perry actually tried to throw his name in the hat uh, to become the president, and they found him to be grossly unqualified, didn't even give him an interview, and you say that this entire board is the fundamental problem of Bethune-Cookman. You might have heard interim President Drake say the board has no involvement in what he does, uh, but what you said two years ago, do you believe that still continues? It, it's, it, of course it still continues. The, board, the, the buck stops at the board's desk. It stops at Belvin Perry's desk. We've been actually calling for Barry, Belvin Perry's uh, uh, removal or resignation since 2017, uh, when he first got on the board. There, and, and part of this, Roland, uh, is part and parcel of a long history of Bethune Cookman not using uh, um, uh, national le na national uh, firms to get the best leadership as possible. They, they, if, if you look at the number of interims, they've had, uh, they, they've already had three interim professors, uh, uh, interim presidents in the last five years. There's still no national search. The last national search that they had came up with Ela Brent Cry, who, in my opinion, is prop was was is responsible for the fact that Bethune Cookman still exists at this point. The only reason that they didn't get their accreditation uh, snatched at that point in time was because SACS, which is the accreditation agency, essentially looked at at, at, uh, at Dr. Kreitz's resume and, and wanted to give him a chance to pull Bethune-Cookman uh, out of the muck and the mire that it was in. That happened, and then what happens? As a consequence of, of uh, Kreitz's uh, uh, desire, essentially, to take Bethune-Cookman in a global direction, which I think he was uh, readily prepared to do, uh, Belvin Perry just decided that, you know what, uh, thank you, brother, and goodbye. You've done what we, what we got you to, to do here. And he and I think, and I asked myself, what is the end game with this guy? The only end game that I can think of is that at some point he wants to be the president of Bethune-Cookman University. But here's the, here's the problem here, and that is it's a private institution. So, frankly, the only way the board gets, I mean, let me know if there's any other way, the only way the board gets removed is that they all got to quit. The, the board doesn't have a boss. Absolutely. The, the only way to get out of it is the board essentially has to fire them. So they, have to, they have to come in, expand. And, and I'm, a, I'm a lawyer with 32 years of experience, a retired lawyer. And, and uh, uh, as, as Johnny Will knows, what would have to happen is that the existing board would have to, ex to expand the board to a certain number and then vote themselves, that, that board would have to uh, uh, vote themselves out reduce the number of, of people on the board and then and, and then to get back to, to where they were. But the, the other thing I think that's very important is that Perry has been very candid with regard to board uh, the, the board governance. What he did, I think, uh, was was to eventually 
to to tweak the bylaws and actually not not tweak the bylaws, but essentially uh, just completely modify the bylaws. Where now there's there's a smaller group of people, uh, and then the 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 the, uh, the students and the alumni have no further impact and no no further input because they're not guaranteed seats on that board. So what all he had to do was to try to keep his friends his. His, his his compadres, his suck ups on that board, to, and, and then because they're they're all that there's no separate kind of oversight or, or independent oversight like you have uh, in the Florida University in the in the university system here in the state of Florida that FAMU Florida A and M University has to deal with and other other the state schools and Bethune Cookman is a private institution. They've hid behind the whole issue of being a private institution and a lack of transparency for 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 decades. And they and you, they have to be dragged into the 21st century with regard to transparency. And when we when you talk about that one percent from 12 percent, that's one of the reasons why it's because we as a black owned and operated media here in Daytona Beach for 40, 45 years have been pushing the alumni not to give to to, to, to Bethune Cookman to establish their own uh, uh, um, uh, uh, foundation and, and and with with their own endowed scholarship. And then, if you're going to give, don't give to the the operating uh, the, the, the operating account, which basically allows them to take their money and to sue their own alumni. Johnny, um, the students they protested today. Uh, the president said, President Drake said that he was happy to see them uh, share their thoughts uh, and feelings. Um, I saw some social media posts from students who said uh, that uh, that the campus was on lockdown. Uh, they were preventing from folks who were coming in. So, again, it's a whole lot of back and forth. Clearly, there is distrust. There's a lot of distrust here. What I hear, and, and, and what Ed, and there are people who are, uh, people, I saw some, there are many people saying, well, Ed, Ring, Ed Reed was wrong. He should have put him on, he should not put him on blast. He should have, should not have called them out. But, but what this seems as if is that Ed Reed's uh, emotional outburst has empowered folk who frankly have felt like they were left out. Well, I, I agree with that. And, and my take, Roland, is Ed Reed is not being offered this job because of a rant. They're not scared of him using profane language because if they were, why would the university at the recent homecoming invite Rick Ross? Why would they invite Glorilla? Uh, and I think Trick Daddy may have been there. And I, I, I respect those brothers, they're successful businessmen, but the language that was being used at the outside the stadium is unacceptable. And it was condoned by the university. But where I'm going is, the problem is not what Ed said. The problem is the board is afraid that it won't be able to control Ed. That's the problem. And let me just tell you this. We have an alum who wrote a very passionate post on Facebook and wrote to one of the newspapers asking about the finances. What happens? The law firm sends this gentleman a cease and desist. We have a young lady who is very passionate about Bethune who asked the same questions and wrote a letter asking, please tell us how much the trustees have given. The next thing you know, the next day she's a, 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 an instructor in the state of Georgia. Her school gets a call from someone who identifies themselves as from Bethune Cookman, trying to fire her. Um, same thing with another gentleman. So anytime at Bethune Cookman you speak out, anytime you ask the relevant questions, especially dealing with finances, and let me say this, this is on record. I served on the board for eight years, four years as the alumni trustee representative, and I also served as an appointed person on the board. I served in many capacities. I, I chaired the legal committee. I'm a lawyer of 43 years. I called for a forensic audit. Uh, Chairman Perry had become chairperson of this board and promised the alumni when my predecessor uh, was president before me that they were doing a forensic audit. Led us to believe this. And then at the 11th and a half hour, he was told none was done. So this is the type problem that we have. It's a trust problem. I listened to the uh, president say that we have locker rooms. Now, I chaired the athletic subcommittee on the board when I was on the board for many years. But Thune Cookman does not have a locker room. The players shower in their rooms oftentimes. 
We do not have shower facilities on this campus uh, in the locker room. That is a bold-faced untruth. So how can we believe when the board tells us, oh, we're doing good financially? We have not had a financial report. My wife and I have an endowment uh, with the university. And, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can't see you, we can still hear you. Okay, my yeah. So what, what happened, I haven't gotten a report of the university in seven, eight years. If you, even though we're a private school and we're not governed by the sunshine laws, if you're asking folk for money, then you have a moral responsibility to let them know how we're doing fiscally. And the board has failed miserably in that regard. That's why we're in a lawsuit. That's why I'm being sued personally by, by, by Belvin Perry and the board members. Got it. Uh, because I dare to ask relevant questions about Mother Mary's legacy. I literally have 20 seconds, Julian. Final comment, 10 seconds, go. The alumni are so very important. I'm glad to hear these brothers. Uh, if there is an alumni trustee, that person ought to be facilitating transparency. Yep. There must be transparency. Uh, must be. Um, look, uh, uh, Julian Omakongo, Renita, I appreciate it. A lot of different moving parts today. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, and uh, Charles, as well as Johnny, thanks a lot. This is not the last time we're going to be talking about this. We're going to have some other alumni folks on tomorrow. I do want the board chair to come on this show. We did reach out. We're going to hear back. And again, I hope the president uh, does invite us to the campus. We will bring, and let me tell you right now, folks, we will bring our cameras to Bethune-Cookman and I want to see the locker rooms. I want to see the facilities. We want to show them for you. And so we will happily do that. And so, again, I'm in Florida on February 5th, uh, getting a award from the Trayvon Martin Foundation. We, we can do this town hall on February 2nd on a Thursday or February 3rd on a Friday. And so we'll be in contact with the president and we'll let you know exactly what happens uh, with that. Uh, let me thank, again, President Drake. Let me thank uh, Ed Reed. Let me thank those three football players who came on as well and all of you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to continue to support Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, by joining our Brina Funk fan club. Go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com for all of those details. Folks, I'll see you tomorrow. Holla! Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches! I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape. With me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network.